Are you ready for a news bulletin that speaks your language? Say goodbye to chaos, confusion and clutter that comes with news and dive into the stories that matter to you and I. Join us as we uncover the remarkable ways our homeland has an impact on the world, one story at a time. Cutting through noise, this is News More Life. For starters, let's look closer to home, right at the heart of our democracy, where the stage is set for another hug and wink moment in the parliament. A dramatic political showdown is underway as the Indian parliament gears up for high-stakes battle, the no-confidence motion. Rahul Gandhi is back in the Lok Sabha and the Modi government is set to face its second no-confidence motion. Expect fireworks. And from what it seems like, Prime Minister Modi had already predicted this back in 2019. <laughs> but how did previous Prime Ministers fare when such a motion was mooted? Let's rewind to 1963, when the first no-confidence motion was moved against the Jawaharlal Nehru government over his China policy. This was right after the 1962 war. And this debate lasted 21 hours and 33 minutes, spread over four days. He defeated the motion. When it comes to facing the most numbers of no-confidence motions, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi wins by a safe margin. She faced 15 motions during her 16-year tenure, and she defeated them each time. She is followed by P.V. Narsimha Rao and Lal Bahadur Shastri with three each and they defeated the motion too. Atal Bihari Vajpayee had moved a confidence motion in April 1999, which he lost by just one vote, which resulted in the premature dissolution of the 12th Lok Sabha. Vajpayee faced a no-confidence motion moved by Sonia Gandhi in 2003 and won. In 2008, the UPA faced the first trust vote led by Manmohan Singh and it won with all the help of its allies. The most recent memory of no-confidence motion was against Prime Minister Modi in 2018. After a 12-hour debate, the Modi government defeated the motion by 199 votes. The present motion will be the 28th no-confidence motion since independence. So what's a no-confidence motion? Essentially, a no-confidence motion challenges the government's majority. The motion must be supported by at least 50 members of the parliament. If the government fails, it must resign. But the NDA has above 320 seats, and they already are in majority. The result of the motion is a foregone conclusion. But the opposition is hoping that this will get the Prime Minister to the Parliament. Prime Minister ko sadan mein khich ke lane ke liye, khich kar lane ke liye, ek hi hamare paas auzar bache huye hai, wo no confidence motion. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal. A terrible manifestation of this line that I'm borrowing from Orwell can be seen in China. Beijing is suffering from the heaviest deluge recorded in 140 years. But the capital has been spared from the worst because the flood waters have been diverted elsewhere. Where? To the adjacent villages and outer cities. And this has inevitably sparked anger amongst the citizens. Streets have turned into canals, bridges are submerged and cars are left waterlogged. Beijing has been battling historic rainfall for the past few weeks. <laughs> Uh,我们也从网上那个看到那个电视上看到刘礼和说桥这儿被淹了。呃,因为我们经常上刘礼和这儿来玩,呃,有时候办事儿啊,来玩,所以我们今天就过来看看。上面有当时淹到二楼还
紧急撤离，那会儿我们就赶紧出来，出来水已经走不了了。我们大门往左，就是洪水来的方向，我带着孩子根本就没法出去。Amidst the chaos, Hebei's party secretary Ni Yufeng's remarks did not go down well with citizens. Activation of flood storage and diversion areas in an orderly manner to reduce the pressure on Beijing's flood control and resolutely build a moat for the capital. Several of them took to Twitter to criticize the secretary. China faces typhoon-heavy rains during the summer months every year, but climate change. Insufficient drainage systems and poor urban planning has pushed China into the direst situation of all. Do you see these creepy dolls? What if I tell you that they are not fake but made from real human body parts? I would have liked it to be just another horror story, but this is a true story. In a spine-tingling revelation, Harvard mortuary manager and owner of a creepy Peabody store have been accused of stealing dissected portions of donated cadavers, including, for example, heads, brains, skin, and bones, and other human remains, and selling it to a nationwide network of buyers. Watch in. Cedric Lodge, a former morgue manager at Harvard Medical School, has been accused of selling heads, brains, skin, and bones from 2018 to early 2023. Lodge has been working as the morgue manager under the anatomical gift program at Harvard Medical School since 1995. He was fired on May the 6th. According to Harvard Medical School, the body parts were taken from the morgue without the school's knowledge or permission. They also called the accusations morally reprehensible. Bodies donated to Harvard Medical School are used for education, teaching, or research purposes. Once they are no longer needed, they are usually cremated. And the ashes are returned to the donor's family or buried in a cemetery. But Lodge, being the morgue manager, found a way to steal the cadavers and sell them to buyers across the United States. Lodge, along with his wife Denise, even kept the stolen body parts at their home sometimes. Some of these remains were then sent to buyers through the U.S. Postal Service, while others were picked up from the morgue by the buyers themselves. The lodges were also part of a larger network operating across the U.S. The network also involved buying and selling of stolen remains obtained from another medical school and a mortuary in Arkansas. Katrina McLean in Massachusetts, Joshua Taylor of Pennsylvania, and Matthew Lampy of Minnesota are among those who've been accused of being part of this network. They bought the organs from Lodge and modified them, sometimes using them as artifacts and then selling them to other buyers. The Kohinoor, Ring of Tipu Sultan, and innumerable antiquities from India have been stolen and have found their way to Western nations. In this special segment, watch how our stolen possessions are making their way back home, one artifact at a time. This man is Subhash Kapoor, an art dealer on the surface, but a smuggler in reality. But he's no ordinary smuggler. He's convicted of theft and illegal export of 19 idols from the Vardaraj Perumal Temple in Tamil Nadu, valued at over 94 crore rupees. He's presently in prison in India, serving a sentence. Arrested first by the German police, charged in the United States of America, and then extradited to India in a case of theft of Chola dynasty artifacts. How did he pull this off? According to American authorities, Kapoor ran an art gallery. Where more than 2,500 items were trafficked by his network, India's police said he first verified the idol's value from the experts and would then bribe the thieves to smuggle all of these artifacts and idols via a road route. The cost of these idols was estimated to be worth over 143 million dollars. Sadly, he's not the only one. It's a mind-boggling chain trail of smuggling precious artifacts out of India. Bought by the Western nations, kept in their museums for display, but are now making their way back into our country. But this is no easy exercise. It's a massive effort of repatriation and bilateral relationship. So stay tuned as I tell you in this very important homeland explainer. This bronze statue belongs to India from 17th century. The red sandstone couple artifact dated 12th to 13th century from Central India. A marble arch parikara from 12th century. All of these were trafficked out of India in different periods. Some were connected to Kapoor and other to other international smugglers. 
Some of these items were displayed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the United States of America, some at the Yale University. Both announced the return of most of these objects, which recently returned to India. Just weeks after Prime Minister Narendra Modi's state visit to the USA, 105 art commodities have been received at the Indian Consulate in New York. According to a government release, the artifacts represent a wide geographical spread in terms of their origin in India. 47 from East, 27 from South, 22 from Central India, 6 from North and 3 from Western India. Not only from the United States of America, but also repatriated from Canada was this Annapurna statue stolen from Benares dated 18th century, brought back to India after 108 years. Remember the mega ceremony in 2021 to install this idol in the Kashi Vishwanath Dham. A report in the Indian Express's investigative series even revealed that the Metropolitan Museum of Art's formidable Asia collection included at least 94 artifacts of Jammu and Kashmir origin. These are sculptures, paintings and manuscripts, none of which had details in their provenance of the background documents or when they were moved out and by whom. This reflects a suspicious collection. Contacting and confronting the Western nations is a strategy that is yielding results. As recent as 1990 in Jammu and Kashmir, when terrorism had erupted, stolen from a temple in Pulwama was this 18-armed Durga idol in Mahishasur Mardini Avtar. This rare 10th century artifact is made of lush greenstone, was first spotted years later in Germany's Linden State Museum for Ethnology. The ASI received a tip-off. Investigation started. Governments were contacted and in 2016, this idol was brought back into India after many efforts. Prime Minister Modi had received it from the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel. So what is the procedure? Once an item is confirmed to be ours and the government intervenes, the procedure usually is that the antiquities are returned first to the Indian authorities abroad, like a mission or an Indian High Commission. Then the External Affairs Ministry informs the Archaeological Survey of India, which is the custodian for these objects. ASI verifies the repatriated object, then physically returns it to India. So multiple layers, including cooperation from other nations, is needed in this. Look at this ceremonial Indo-Persian talwar, believed to date back to 14th century. The sword is shaped like a snake, has serrated edges with gold etchings of an elephant and tigers. This was the sword of the Nizam of Hyderabad till 1905. What remains a mystery is how this sword was allegedly sold by Nizam's Prime Minister Maharaja Kishan Prasad to a British General Sir Archibald Hunter. Anyway, this was packed into crates at the Glasgow Museum Resort Centre and transferred to the Archaeological Survey of India after the issue was raised to the government. Remember that for any authority to return items is a full-fledged mission. The Glasgow Museums in Scotland agreed to return seven stolen artefacts to India. For this, the delegates from the Indian High Commission had to sign an agreement. Ownership transfer documents were cleared as well. This is one of the first repatriations considered from the United Kingdom in 2022. There were 14th century carvings, 11th century stone door jams from Kanpur temple, which was stolen from shrines and temples in the 19th century. This just keeps turning so bizarre and will also make you very, very angry. Here's why. An Indian idol of goat-headed yogini dating back to the 10th century was illegally removed from a village temple in Uttar Pradesh over 40 years ago and was discovered in a private garden, randomly kept collecting moss in England. A similar sculpture of the buffalo-headed Vrishnana Yogini, apparently stolen from the same temple at Lokhari village, was found in Paris. Connect the dots of how statues from India are found in different Western nations. It's nerve-wracking how these Western nations are so eager to keep Indian heritage items, sometimes unknowingly that it is smuggled out, and sometimes fully aware that it belongs solely to Indian territory. And some are fighting back this monstrosity now. Indian Pride Project, it was co-founded in 2014 by S. Vijay Kumar and Anurag Saxena and joined by now activists from all over the world. They help identify stolen religious artifacts from Indian temples and secure their return to their original rightful place. They of course coordinate with the government for this. They have helped the government return several artifacts back to India, processing the requisite documentation, for example with the British government and with Indian authorities. As on April 24, 2023, 251 invaluable antiquities of Indian origin have been confirmed retrieved back from different nations, out of which 238 were brought back since 2014. But sources say more than 50,000 art objects have been smuggled out of India till 1989. This is not just about the United States of America or the United Kingdom. 
our heritage objects are even spotted in Australia. These were being held in the National Gallery of Australia. On display, some were statues of Lord Shiva and his disciples, worshipping Shakti, Lord Vishnu and his avatars, including from the Jain tradition. Because India and Australia have now been strengthening their friendship, therefore in March 2022, 29 antiquities were repatriated to India and how. So now you know that the Archaeological Survey of India's responsibility is not just to undertake archaeological research and conservation, but it's also to recover precious stolen antiquities. As Parliament session is on, on 24 July 2023, our lawmakers have recommended establishing a dedicated cultural heritage squad for the recovery of stolen antiquities. That means also have a multi-department trained task force of officers in various aspects of retrieval that can be followed as is in other countries too. Of course, all eyes will now be on the much-discussed Kohinoor diamond. But while we are at it, such initiatives can succeed only and also with international cooperation. Newly developed mechanisms, proper documentation by India, but above all, there needs to be an end to the desperation of Western nations to hoard our items that do not belong to them, that belongs to India, always did. And it is time for reparation now. That's all the news that we have for today. This is Jessica Goel signing off for the day. For more informative videos like this, keep watching India Today Newsmo.